installment of the Addiction Psychiatry Consortium Conference. Before we begin, may we ask everyone to take a moment of silence as we start our consortium with an opening prayer. Universal Heavenly Father, this consortium has occurred because we all want to do Recording in progress. Kingdom. We pray that we do not go weary while doing good things, for in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We believe that you will guide us in this Addiction Psychiatry Consortium Conference so that the results can be seen days, months, and even years after today. We come expecting to make a mark on this earth for your glory, but we can only do it with your grace. Please grant us, Father, your protection and healing each day. Inspire us always to be your light for others. Amen. Good morning once more to all of you, and welcome to the this installment of the Addiction Psychiatry Consortium Conference. We would like to thank our partners for making this conference possible. 
Johnson & Johnson's Philippines, Torrent Pharma, Zaidus Neurosciences, Otsuka, Vexa Life Sciences, and Lundbeck. For today, we will be having a presentation by the Medical City. Just a review, the following is the format for each presentation. Each Addiction Psychiatry Consortium Conference would be around 2 hours maximum. 45 minutes will be dedicated to the addiction case presentation, 40 minutes for theoretical discussion. This will be followed by Q&A. After which, there will be reactors' comments coming from the institution and then from the group of addiction psychiatry of the Philippines. We will then follow it up with an evaluation, picture-taking for attendance, and a reminder for the next schedule. Let's proceed with today's program by introducing our presenter. Our presenter is Dr. Clyde Gareth D. from the Medical City. Dr. D. graduated from the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health last 2021, and he is currently a second-year resident at the Medical City Department of Psychiatry. We will follow his presentation with a reaction from the institution reactor, um, Dr. Joyce Ann Maglake. She's a consultant at the Medical City Section of Addiction Psychiatry, where she also had her residency training and subsequent fellowship training at the same institution. Apart from her clinical work, she's also a faculty of the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health, a certified facilitator for mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and is pursuing certification for CBT therapy. She is currently a fellow of the Philippine Psychiatric Association, an international resident fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and a new member of the American Academy for Addiction Psychiatry. This would be followed by the GAP reactor, Dr. Renee Celeste Obra Puno, she, is, um, she took her BA Psychology in UP and attended medicine in Cebu Doctors University. She then had her OJT in AnMed Behavioral Health Center in South Carolina, USA. Following this, she had her residency training in Makati Medical Center and then pursued Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship training at the Medical City, which she finished last 2020. Currently, she is a diplomate of the Philippine Psychiatric Association and part of the Secretary Committee of the Group for Addiction Psychiatry of the Philippines, or GAP. Before we begin, just a few reminders. If possible, kindly rename yourself to include your name and institution. If you are sharing a Zoom account, kindly rename as well to reflect your institution and the surnames of the people you're sharing your Zoom account with. Kindly keep your microphone muted and be mindful as background noises may distract our presenter. You may put your questions and comments in the general chat box and they will be addressed during the Q&A session. At the end of the whole APCC, we will be having a class picture. So everyone kindly check if you are on mute as we now give the floor to Dr. Clyde D to present his case. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's The Group for Addiction Psychiatry of the Philippines. Today will be presented by uh, the Medical City titled Icarus. It will be presented by me, Clyde Gareth Ang D, second year psychiatry resident. The objectives are as follows, to present a case of a physician with chronic benzodiazepine and opioid use disorder 
to enumerate physician specialization at the highest risk for substance use disorder alongside its accompanying unique risk factors and expected outcomes. To discuss aftercare programs for recovery as well as relapse prevention to illustrate current dilemmas and recommendations in re-entry into previous workplace. Starting off with the identifying data, Icar is a 63-year-old male, widower, Filipino Christian, lives along in an area in the South with his only son working as a physician. Informant is Icar of poor reliability due to being guarded and often minimizing with collateral information from the son of poor reliability as most of the substance use was left unknown to him. And Icar's colleagues of good reliability as they witnessed him use and his accompanying behaviors in the workplace, but with noted limited information. For the chief complaint, According to Icar, according to Icar, he is pre-morbid described as a perfectionist, intelligent, achiever, workaholic, and keeps things to himself. According to his son, he is described as an absent father, closed off, never vulnerable, and emotionally distant. According to his colleagues, he was described as my pride, never backing down, and rational. Before my HPI, I would like to present a graph detailing the substance and its relation to toxicity of workload, how it affected mood, and subsequently the functionality. Twenty-four years prior to admission, after finishing his training, Icar moved to the south where his wife was originally from. They decided to settle there because there were only a few physicians who would practice a certain type of subspecialty. He was subsequently hired in a private hospital. Initially, his workload was manageable where he was able to have appropriate meal times and even exercise. As he built his practice, his caseload increased and work hours started to be more erratic. Despite enjoying the heavy workload, he worried how he was going to fit everything in his schedule and there would be times that he felt like he was on the edge. He proceeded to have less amount of sleep, less than eight hours, and since he wanted faster initiation to accommodate everything, he proceeded to take either one capsule of diphenhydramine or three milligrams of melatonin per day. He denied feeling grog. Generally, his wife was also busy as she was also building her own practice and swamped with her own patients as well. In the interim, his caseload increased and his schedule became more erratic, where some were emergencies. This worsened his worries. He was forced to take naps in between patients due to sleepless nights. His previous medications were not working anymore. Hence, proceeded to self-medicate with alprazolam, 125 to 250 micrograms, or clonazepam, 1 milligram to 2 milligrams for faster initiation and onset. He claimed to have more restful sleep. In addition to this, he ate less, which led to weight loss. His colleagues were worried about him due to his caseload. He often said that he was fine and would never turn down any cases because there were only a few people practicing his subspecialty. According to his son, he was rarely seen at the home and mostly stayed in the hospital. The son was mostly cared for by either his grandmother, aunts, and uncles. 18 years prior to admission, he was promoted, which resulted to more cases. He subsequently had less time for sleep and meals. He needed to take more naps and was already getting frustrated that the previous medications were too slow to work, thus proceeded to inject himself with one-fourth to one-half cc of midazolam. He collected these from leftovers from cases, thus initially used around three to four per month, depending on its availability. There were times that when he was doing some of his procedures, he was drowsy and had instances of hospital injury, which didn't really bother him so much. 
14 years prior to admission, alongside the increased work, he had to take shorter naps already. To get by, his midazolam use increased to around 6 to 10 times per month. He was observed by his colleagues to be drowsy and disoriented. There were unexplained disappearances, and when he was asked where he went, he shared that he just fell asleep. He was observed by his wife and colleagues to be injecting himself with IV medications. The colleagues did not know how to go about it, but when the wife confronted him, he often got irritable. At this point, his son witnessed Icar having frequent fights with his mom, which scared him. He also didn't know that his dad was using any substances. Icar denied any withdrawal symptoms, mood lability, decreased need for sleep, increased cold directed activity, or hyperactivity. In the interim, his performance in work proceeded to deteriorate, where he either took more breaks or had unexplained absences. In one, in some of his procedures, he would have documentation errors where the data was supposedly for another patient. This made his previous partners hesitant in calling for his services. Because of his lapses, there was also a building reputation about his substance use. Despite this, he was not really confronted by his colleagues because of his seniority over them. His son now observed his mom to be giving Icar unknown medications with a syringe. Whenever the son would ask the mom, it was explained to him that it was to help Icar calm down. His colleagues were already contemplating that Icar may need to go to a rehabilitation center, which they expressed to his immediate family and even Icar siblings. However, they often verbalized that rehabilitation would be up to Icar. His wife and son did not pursue any form of rehabilitation as well. Seven years prior to admission, Icar woke up to the screams of his son. He was told that his wife suddenly died. However, Icar did not see the body. He also did not want to see the body. He told his son to call for help. They later discovered that she suddenly died of myocardial infarction. Icar was shocked because it came so sudden he, and he did not observe any signs at all. He felt guilty and blamed himself, thinking that if he paid attention, he could have noticed something early. Following these events, according to the son, Icar distanced himself from the family of his late wife because he felt that they were blaming him. He was observed to have depressed mood, poor appetite, feelings of guilt, low energy, and expressed wanting to die. Because of this, his son enrolled him into a counseling session for debriefing to heal through the tragedy together. This brought minimal relief to what he felt, thus only agreed to two sessions. His son reported that it was because his dad was closed off and felt like he was not yet ready to process his grief. In addition to this, he did not want to be evaluated by younger doctors whom he felt knew less than what he did. However, his son continued with the therapy and even had individual therapy for himself. In the interim, aside from cleaning, he left most of his deceased wife things untouched and refused to talk about her with anyone. In order not to remember her and the associated negative feelings, he began to take around one half to one ml of fentanyl via IV, sometimes alongside the midazolam, which he would usually take. Again, he ob obtained these from leftovers. During the times that there was no stock, he took either alprazolam or clonazepam, but often expressed that it was not the same. He was confident that he can control his, its effects. He was observed by his colleagues to have impaired attention slurred speech, and often asleep. Due to this, he would rely more on his juniors. At this time, he was now known in the workplace as the physician who was always intoxicated. He was already being confronted by his colleagues, but he denied all allegations. Thus, they were already contemplating on bringing him involuntarily to a rehab. Despite all of this, he still claimed that he was still able to perform his work and he was still being demanded for his services. 
Four years prior to admission, due to persistence of his behavior, one of his colleagues told his son about his substance use, which the son was left surprised. They also tried to contact the siblings to push for rehab, but could not get their support because they shared that they were relying on him heavily for financial support. No one would fund it should it push through. In the interim, despite the pandemic, his use continued. One of the staff found multiple vials of nalbifin in his bag, which was reported to a senior physician at that time. When Icar was confronted, he claimed that he was keeping it for his patients. However, this was not allowed by the hospital, and they suspected that Icar obtained this from an outside source. And when asked, he denied. No further action was done. Four weeks prior to admission, there was an instance where Icar was difficult to rouse. So his son was worried that his dad might have overdosed, hence called one of their physician friends. He was assessed and was luckily alive. It was also found that there were multiple vials of fentanyl or nalbufin in his room. The friend decided to clean up the room and threw away all the vials. When Icar woke up, the son noticed that he frantically looked for the vials. He rushed downstairs and yelled at both of his son and physician friend. He broke plates and other household items in a fit of rage. It was at this point that the son was convinced that his dad was already abusing drugs. However, he felt powerless and afraid in front of him. Meanwhile, the physician friend tried to explain themselves and told Icar that he needed to either see a psychiatrist or go to a rehab already. Icar was enraged, told him that their friendship was over, and demanded for that friend to leave. Three weeks prior to admission, Icar complained of chest pain, tachycardia, abdominal pain, dizziness, and dyspnea. He proceeded to tell his son to bring him to a small private hospital that he was affiliated with. Workup revealed unstable angina. He was surprised because he was always well prior to this. During that admission, for roughly a week, he was referred to a psychiatrist for sleeping problems, underwent detoxification, and was eventually started on ketiapine. Following his admission, he took his time recuperating at home. Through his son, he received a letter that he was suspended in the hospital he was working in light of his substance abuse until cleared by a psychiatrist. He continued to follow up with his psychiatrist where his ketiapine was increased to 200 mg per day to be given at bedtime. He was also closely being monitored for his new heart condition by his cardiologist. Overall, he noticed improved sleep and overall disposition. This was corroborated by his son who was with him 24-7. On his subsequent follow-ups, he was advised by his psychiatrist that in order to be cleared for work, he needed to undergo detoxification and evaluation by an addiction psychiatrist. He was then transferred from the clinic to our institution, hence admission. Throughout the history, no elated mood, decreased need for sleep, flight of ideas, self-harm, suicidal attempt, and auditory or visual hallucinations. This, again, is the summary of the HPI in graph form. For review of the systems, I just wanted to highlight there, there was no um, pertinent withdrawal or intoxication symptoms, such as no fever, no drowsiness, no diaphoresis, no tinnitus, no grain of vision, no photophobia. No dyspnea, no palpitations, no seizures, no attacks, no slurring, no nausea or vomiting, no muscle pain, and no muscle twitching. For the other portions of the history, for past medical history, unstable angina, 2022, status post-thyroid abscess drainage, 2021, no allergies to food or medications, fully vaccinated for COVID, no previous psychiatric history, for legal history, no history of legal problems. For family history, hypertension, both from his mother and father's side, colon cancer brother, possible alcohol use disorder, his father, and major depressive disorder with anxious distress, uh, his son, who is maintained on escitalopram. 
for his substance history, um, it is as follows. For tobacco, his first use was when he was 23 years old. His last use was in 2018. Um, previous use was 19.5 pack years. Period of abstinence, three years. Root was through inhalational. When using it, it lifts his mood, decreases tension, improves attention. For withdrawal, there is some cravings, irritability, tension, and difficulties concentrating. He would not use this in combination with other substances. For diphenhydramine, 34 years old, last use was around 2021 to 2022, 50 milligrams once a day, period of abstinence one year, root oral, when he would use it, he's drowsy, no noted withdrawal or in combination with other substances. For alprazolam, its first use was 40 years old, last use was 2022, he would use around 125 micrograms once a day. Um, period of abstinence was three weeks. Root is through oral when intoxicated, drowsy, uh, denies any withdrawals or in combination with any substances. For clonazepam, 40 years old also. Uh, last use was 2022. Current use is around 1 milligram to 2 milligrams once a day. Period of abstinence is three weeks. Oral root when intoxicated, drowsy, denies withdrawals or use in combination with other substances. For midazolam, his first use was 45 years old. Last use was December 2022. He would take around 1 fourth to 1 half ml per instance with his peak at around 20 times per month. Period of abstinence is three weeks. Root is through IV. When intoxicated, there's behavioral inhibition, incoordination, dysarthria, impaired memory, and gait, gait disturbances. Denied any withdrawal symptoms and uses it in combination with fentanyl. For fentanyl, his first use was when he was 56 years old. Last use was 20, December 2022. He would take roughly 1 half ml to 1 ml per instance of around 20 times per month. Period of abstinence is three weeks as well, uses it via IV. Um, intoxication would be when he gets drowsy, slurred speech, impaired memory, and attention. Withdrawals would be tachycardia and abdominal pain and uses it with midazolam. For nalbufin, um, similar profile to fentanyl, it's just that um, we do not know his current or previous use. We denied intake of alcohol, cannabis, barbiturates, stimulants, ketamine, GHP, hallucinogens, and inhalants. He denied gambling, gaming, and internet addiction. There was no history of undergoing a rehab program. For motivation and goals, he denied use being problematic in work, and its only detriment was on his physical health, which led to the unstable angina. He is currently on pre-contemplation stage. For the anamnesis, Icar was born fifth in a brood of five and the only boy. He was born via NST to a 43-year-old G5P4400 for mom. There was no fetal maternal complications. He was originally born in the Visayas region. His father was a businessman and was described as loving and affectionate father who play, paid close attention to the needs of his children. Icar was closer to his dad because they spent a lot of time together either going out or playing sports. He was the main breadwinner and disciplinarian. On the other hand, his mom was managing a family-owned Sari Sari store. She was described as rational, serious, and rarely showed any emotions. She was also a breadwinner and the main caregiver because she spent most of her days at home tending to the children. Growing up, Icar was described as an easy child and rarely disciplined. He was his parents' favorite among the other siblings because he was the most intelligent and most accomplished academically. Due to this, he was often given what he wanted. Icar remembers that it was only his baby pictures that was plastered on his mom's mirror. He had a good relationship with his older siblings and they tended to be very protective of him. 
He was described to be the baby and arrow ng tahanan of the family. He often mentioned that his role was to make his family happy. In grade school, he was the only one who attended a private school. He was always the top of his class and loved to engage in extracurricular activities such as church choir or even being the class president. At this age, he claimed that despite spending more time playing outside, he was still at the top of his class. He was also particular with his friends and only chose those who were a good influence on him. He denied being bullied or having significant conflicts with his friends. No symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. At the age of nine, his father passed away due to myocardial infarction. This devastated him and he remembered being sad over it. Financially, they had a hard time and his mom took on more jobs to support the children. She rarely spent any time at home and was immersed in her job. Icar remembered that he never saw his mom struggling or having a hard time. She always gave off this impression that she can handle it, which Icar admired. Icar also noticed that the only time his mom would interact with him is to congratulate him on his achievements. His older siblings also had to stop school in order to help support the household as well, while the rest of the siblings were in charge of caring for Icar. They did all the chores while Icar was tasked to focus only on his studies. To cheer them up, Icar continued to bring joy to them where they told him that it washed away all the exhaustion that they felt. In high school, he also did well and graduated at the top of his class. He had high aspirations because he wanted to help his family who often encouraged him to just do well in school. For college, he took nursing and graduated as the top of his batch. For college, he took nursing and also graduated at the top of his batch. He wanted to pursue medicine, however, his mom was against it, given how physically taxing it was. On the other hand, his siblings encouraged him and were telling him that they were going to support him through and through. He subsequently was able to pursue it. Throughout his stay, he was always also at the top of his class. He pursued further studies and was able to accomplish it. Icar often mentioned how he found it easy and was well, of, well aware of how smart he was. He trained in a public hospital in Metro Manila where he also did well. He described that in the public hospital, they often had so many patients but needed to sleep in order to function the following day. He would notice some of his colleagues using sleep aids such as diphenhydramine, melatonin, or even clonazepam so that they can have a proper power nap and perform optimally afterwards. He denied any use of sleep aids. He also continued to support his mom and siblings. He met his wife in training in Manila, who came from a prominent family of physicians. Icar liked how esteemed and well-known the family was. Hence, after subspecialty training, they pursued life back in his wife's hometown. At age 31, despite, sorry, at age 31, they got married and proceeded to have one son. Despite living in another region, he continued to support his mom and siblings by giving him money or giving him a chance to work for him, such as caring for his son. Due to this, and despite the substance use, they usually just went along with whatever Icar wanted. Icar described his marriage as perfect and often with little conflict. Or according to the son, his parents were often busy. They were both described as cold and rarely expressed any emotions. The son often expressed how much he wanted to be close to his dad, but was always afraid of him because he was always so irritable. Ever since finding out about his dad's substance use, he was he always wanted him to stop. For the physical exam, the vital signs are as follows and his were stable. For anthropometrics, his weight is at 20.2, so normal. For systemic physical exam, it was largely unremarkable. Same goes for the neurologic exam. He was awake, alert, and oriented. Motor, sensory, and reflexes were also tested, which were also normal. 
cerebellar examination, and meningeal signs were also minimal. The mental status exam at the ER, I wasn't the admitting resident, but the admitting resident's MSc was as follows. Icar was an adult, Filipino male of average statue and medium build. He is seen wearing glasses, shoulder length black hair, dressed in a long sleeve top and jeans and dressed appropriately for chronological age. He was calm, cooperative and conversant with good eye contact. Speech is normal, productive and non-pressured with normal tone and volume. Mood was slightly irritable with congruent affect. He denied suicidal ideations. No perceptual disturbances. Responses are goal-directed. Poor impulse control, poor insight. My MSE on the time of admission when I was able to see ICAR, on MSE, he is seen as an adult Filipino male of average stature and average build. He is seen wearing glasses, shoulder length, black hair, and dressed in a hospital gown. He was seen seated on the hospital bed with an IV line hook. He is calm, cooperative, and conversant with good eye contact. Speech is spontaneous, normal, productive, non-pressured, with normal tone, normal volume, and normal rate. Mood is euthymic with congruent affect. Denies suicidal ideations. Responses are goal-directed. Denies auditory and visual hallucinations. Patient is oriented to three spheres, intact concentration, intact immediate recent and remote memory, Intact calculation, intact fund of memory, good abstract reasoning, poor insight. For salient features, for subjective, ICAR is a 63-year-old male with the coming in for sleep problems. There's a history of chronic polysubstance use disorder due to demanding workload and death of his wife, which led to impairments in work and relationships. Um, there was also elicited depressed mood and worries. At an early age, the lack of good models for embracing his emotions and he was often placed on a pedestal where that's the most that he receives validation. For objective, vital signs were stable. Um, we used a scale to monitor for opioid withdrawal, which is cows, and when it was done, it was four, so mild. And subsequently, for benzodiazepines, we were also using a scale called CWAB, and the scale showed zero. So not in there were no signs of withdrawal at that time. No track marks on his forearms and interdigit areas. Normal neuro exam, awake oriented to three spheres, euthymic poor insight, stage of change, pre-contemplation. For my assessment. My initial working impression would be, given the following predominant symptoms of depressed mood, insomnia, loss of energy, feelings of guilt, recurrent thoughts about death, worries, irritability, feeling on the edge, impulsivity, and risk-taking behavior. In the context of benzodiazepines and opioid use, my primary consideration is a substance-induced disorder. However, it is important to consider a primary, primary mood and anxiety disorder given the risk factors that ICAR has that resulted to increasing the amount of substances that he took. I will discuss this in the following. For my differentials, persistent depressive disorder with intermittent major depressive episode can be considered due to symptoms of depressed mood, insomnia, decrease in appetite, loss of energy, feelings of guilt, recurrent thoughts about death, with more than two years duration, with the sudden increase in addition of a substance, which is fentanyl. Um, it caused significant impairments in work. Um, it's precipitated by stressors, such as the sudden death of his wife. Um, early childhood risk factors that predispose him to a primary depressive disorder would be the early loss of a parent at nine years old. Alongside this, another differential would be prolonged grief disorder due to depressed mood following the death of his wife, yearning for his wife, avoidance of reminders that his wife has to see. However, it can be sufficiently ruled out because the current symptomatology can be better explained by the persistent depressive disorder aside from the substance-induced disorder. Another consideration would be 
GAD due to symptoms of worries, feeling on the edge, irritability, sleep disturbances, and these symptoms have occurred prior to the use of the substances and may have possibly worsened with the use of substances. Um, despite the patient denying being a worrier and at most, he claims that it's work-related and not in other areas. His history predisposes him to a anxiety disorder due to the need to always perform and do well in whatever he is doing. And he is always concerned with the quality of his work. Um, Pre-morbid, he is a perfectionist and dissatisfaction with things less than perfect or anxiety-provoking events. Um, his substance of choice are also anxiolytic, which can be telling of what he is experiencing. However, again, um, the anxiety can also be part of the substances, rather the withdrawal of the substances he was using. Final considerations would be bipolar 2 disorder due to being preceded by a depressive episodes and with noted irritability and grandiose, which would be described as, as he would often claim that um, he is often sought out by his colleagues. Um, he's one of the best in his field. Um, there's also the impulsivity, risky behavior, um, and substance use and significant stressful life events that are risk factors for him. On the other hand, um, narcissistic personality traits is also considered due to the seemingly pervasive pattern of this grandiosity. As also noted by the pre-morbid state, his colleagues often describe him. There is a sense of self-importance, requires excessive admiration, believes that he is unique and should only associate with people of high status or of value, the lack of empathy, shows arrogant behaviors and attitude. He was placed on a pedestal at an early age where validation is often through academic achievements and such. Okay. Okay, for... This slide, um, I just wanted to show the substance use disorder um, diagnosis for ICAR. Um, the new coding scheme indicates that we have to place the severity at the start and the specific substance that um, the specific substance use. Uh, disorder, such as severe midazolam use disorder, severe alprazolam use disorder, severe clonazepam use disorder, severe fentanyl use disorder, and severe nalbifin use disorder. Um, as seen in the rule-in portion, it would be the symptoms of substance use disorder, and the number indicates the severity. So more than six would usually indicate a severe form of substance use disorder. In, given this, my initial impression would still be a substance-induced depressive disorder versus a primary persistent depressive disorder with intermittent major depressive episode without current episode. And then given the risk factors as well as the possible irritability, as well as the possible um, symptoms of hypomania, I'd also like to consider bipolar 2 disorder, most recent episode depressed. Um, to consider generalized anxiety disorder um, and then the following substance use disorders. And lastly, narcissistic personality traits. For workup, it was mostly normal. And when we did the urine drug screen, um, there was none detected. For imaging results, chest x-ray had no significant chest findings. 12-lead ECG was also normal without any QT prolongation. Okay. Um, at the ER, the resident had a hard time getting history because ICAR denied any form of substance use and was only being admitted to fix his knee. 
he also often talked down to the resident who was interviewing him. The patient was awake, alert, and conversant. Vital signs were stable. We did the monitoring for opioids and benzos, and they were for um, benzo, it was mild. For the opioids, it was none. Baseline laboratories were done alongside urine drug screen, and once adequate sample for the urine drug screen was collected, he was started on detoxification protocol, which involves one liter of plain LR to run for 10 hours to alternate with one liter of plain LR to run for 10 hours with multivitamins. Oral B, I oral vitamin B one tab thrice a day and oral vitamin C one tab twice a day. Maintenance medications were continued and he was referred to cardiology services for monitoring of cardiac status. We also opted to continue his ketiapine IR 200 mg per tab one tab once a day. On day one of hospital stay, um, Siwa B also showed that it was mild. Um, we, we tried to do a rehistory and rapport building. Um, he continued to, to deny any substance use, admits to only have used alprazolam and clonazepam at this point. He denied use of opioids. He was generally euthymic and poor insight. Baseline laboratories came out and they were all within normal limits. And then the UDS results came out on this day where it was all below threshold. Stage of change is still at pre-contemplation. Day two of hospital stay, he was comfortable and euthymic. It was disclosed that there was no substance detected. And he asked how long will the detoxification procedure last because he already wants to go home. He expressed that it will hopefully end in one week's time because his colleague were already looking for him to do procedures. Attending physician met with the son. At the ER, the son described that the after the resident left Icar's bedside, Icar scolded him for disclosing that the real reason for admission was the substance use and detoxification. Icar's colleagues have been contacting him to solicit support to have Icar undergo rehab. He was also sent a letter detailing ICAR's suspension from the hospital he was working. An assessment of ICAR's insight was discussed and the options for rehab were also brought up. The son said that they have been planning to bring ICAR to a rehab facility before, but the siblings always backed out at the last minute. He also narrated an instance after ICAR's recent admission where one of his siblings was at their house cleaning. As ICAR got home, he berated his siblings for cleaning the house and touching his belongings. The son described that the siblings just did what Icar wanted. He, the son also said that he does not want to be the only one burdened should his dad go to an inpatient facility. In the spirit of motivational interview, um, during rounds with the attending physician, it was disclosed that he may need to undergo a program where a drug counselor was part of the aftercare. Um, suspension from the hospitals were also discussed. He disclosed that he injected fentanyl and experienced withdrawal symptoms prior, such as tachycardia and abdominal pain. Um, <clears throat> he revealed that it was because of these symptoms that brought him to a hospital four weeks prior to his current admission. Building discrepancy was done, but he denied that his substance use was a problem. He was only using it for sleep. He asked when he can also go. Generally, when we brought up the idea of him going to a rehab program, for him to be able to return back to work, he was amenable to On day four to five of hospital stay, Icar had his first session with a drug counselor as part of his transition into being introduced to the possibility of an inpatient program in another country. He was not sure why he always had a hard time sleeping 
and then the drug counselor noticed that there was a lot of resistance encountered in the form of denial and loss of control. No other way to sleep but through medications. He was amenable to continuing sessions because he may, it made him look at things he has never thought of before. At night, the attending physician had a meeting with his friends. These were the very same friends who referred him to a psychiatrist as well. It was elicited that he has not been functional at work anymore and has developed a reputation as someone who was always intoxicated. They were concerned about him because his substance use was an open secret. They disclosed that they discovered his stock of medications, which he denied when confronted. He either pointed out that it was his wife or he was keeping it for the sake of his patients. They have also expressed wanting Icar to undergo inpatient rehab, but when invited to confront him, they opted not to. They alluded that it should be the family and they did not want to risk ruining their friendship. Despite further conversations and motivational interviewing to make them engage with Icar about his use, all of his friends did not want to. They expressed that it was either seniority of Icar or fear of losing the friendship. Um, and the attending physician met with the son. Icar's siblings were asked to join the family session on the following day. However, they opted not to and would just leave to whatever Icar would want. On day six of hospital stay, the attending physician had a family session with Icar and his son. The patient was confronted of all the previously elicited information. He does not recall any of the events and denied any substance abuse. He recognized that it may have happened but blamed that no one ever told him anything. The focal point of the session was the discussion of feelings that have been they have been holding out from one another. At the end of the session, they resolved to be more open and vulnerable to each other. It was also disclosed to him that he is suspended until cleared. There was also a discussion of possible rehabilitation programs where ICAR was the one who volunteered the possibility of an inpatient rehab in Thailand. A separate family visit was done between ICAR and his son, and it was genuinely pleasant. They just knock, they mostly talked about their plans for rehab. Icar also requested for his son to inform all his colleagues that he was not going to be able to return to work until further notice. For the medications, um, he was started on gabapentin for 300 milligram per capsule, one capsule at bedtime as adjunct for sleep and anxiety. We also wanted to start him on naltrexone, but this was not cleared by cardiologists, given that it may induce an ACS in patients with an underlying ischemic disease, such as ICAR. Stage of change would be pre-contemplation to contemplation. However, um, it also felt like ICAR was doing all of this just for compliance sake. Just to touch briefly on what a family session is, um, the aim is really to help the physician accept professional care. Um, the process is presenting facts to a person with a substance-related problem about their behavior in a way that raises awareness, lessens denial, motivates the person to make a change, and building insight. Participants in an intervention describe to the physician specific observable problematic behaviors and incidents that may have led to the concern about their impairment. They should be kind, empathic, express positive regard for the physician's abilities and avoid accusations, blame, arguing, or negotiating. An intervention should have a specific plan of action, typically identifying the preferred setting for professional assessment and treatment and providing um, a safe transition. Intervention participants may include the physician colleagues, friends, staff, or family 
or anyone who is a important stakeholder. The intervention leader should be a experienced profession who is familiar with the intricacies of the physician's role. Participants in the intervention should be prepared that the physician may respond with resistance, anger, and possible threats of legal action. Such responses should never be a barrier to proceeding because in based on the research, physicians' initial response of anger is often replaced with gratitude as they get better and progress in recovery. Okay. So day seven of hospital stay, um, ICAR had a meeting with the representatives from the inpatient rehab. Um, he liked that the he liked the program, and given that it was only one month, it will speed up speed up the process of his clearance. The son was updated with regards to this meeting, and he liked it. He was agreeable because he feels like the CBT and the grief processing is something that would be helpful for ICAR. For the last few days of his hospital stay, it was making arrangements and then he was subsequently discharged and will proceed straight to the airport. Um, his medications were ketiapine, 200 mg per tab, one tab once a day at bedtime for mood and sleep. Um, gabapentin, 300 mg per capsule, one capsule already once a day at bedtime for anxiety and sleep. And his maintenance medications were continued care of cardiology service. His discharge program would be inpatient rehab while the stage of change was somewhere between pre-contemplation and contemplation. Given all of this, my final working impression would still be substance-induced depressive disorder versus persistent depressive disorder with intermittent major depressive episode with current, without current episode to consider a possible bipolar 2 disorder, most recent episode depressed, to consider uh, generalized anxiety disorder, severe midazolam use disorder, severe alprazolam use disorder, severe clonazepam use disorder, severe fentanyl use disorder, severe nalbifin use disorder, and narcissistic personality traits. Moving on to the discussion. Um, in the U.S., the prevalence of substance use disorders among physicians is similar to that in the general population. Um, several studies have revealed that alcohol is the most common substance of concern in this population, with prescription opioids being the second most common. Um, previous research suggests that rates of prescription drug misuse, notably benzos and opioids, were higher among physicians when compared with the general population. The prevalence of co-occurring psychiatric disorders in physicians with substance use disorder is high, with estimates of 25 to 75 percent. Um, major depressive disorder is still the most common, and next one would be bipolar disorder. Um, generalized anxiety disorder is the fourth most common comorbidity in physicians with substance use disorder. So possibly all three of these can um, occur in, in physicians and is possibly seen in ICAR. Okay. Highest specializations at risk for substance use are anesthesiologists, emergency medicine, and psychiatrists. Multiple studies suggest that pediatricians have the lowest rate of substance use disorder. Research, research suggests that use of specific drug classes may vary across medical special, uh, specialties. So for emergency medicine, it's cocaine. For anest, it's opioid and alcohol. For psychiatrists, it's benzodiazepines. Physicians in general, um, there are some unique risk factors to physicians that predispose them to a prime to a substance use disorder. Um, for example, doctors are trained and conditioned to be self-reliant and self-sufficient. 
that they are more likely to attempt to treat themselves than members of the general population, which can be seen in Icar as she would try various amounts of sleep aids just to help her fall asleep. The greater access to prescription drugs compared to non-physicians. Um, the medications that Icar was using often required a special license so that he can procure it. The ability to perform under stress and despite personal difficulties is the hallmark of the profession. Physicians are taught to place their own needs um, secondary to others. And this is something that ICAR has also been doing given the increasing amount of caseloads that he has been having. Confidence in understanding medications may contribute to self-medication and underestimating the consequences of unsupervised or non-medical use of prescription drugs. This was often seen in ICAR when he claimed that he was confident in how the medications work and it was all under his control. Professional arrogance can lead to difficulty taking directions or input from others. This is also in conjunction with um, the sen senior, senior role that ICAR has been occupying. Um, physicians often have sophisticated denial with elaborate justification and ras rationalization, making interventions more difficult. Many physicians have difficulty admitting that the clinical care they have been providing is impaired, such as when Icar would always say that um, he, he's still doing fine, his colleagues are still looking for his services, and he was not doing nothing. Okay. Gender may also be a factor. Research suggests that female physicians with substance use disorder are not referred for treatment as frequently as male physicians. However, um, in based on this research, female physicians often have more severe substance use disorder or a more severe psychiatric comorbidity at the time of referral. When it comes to identifying impaired physicians, um, these were the ones that were most commonly observed. So changes in mood and affect. So with ICAR, it was the irritability. Um, decreased pro productivity. In ICAR, it was the tardiness, the absence, and the frequent breaks. Um, increased stakes, such as when ICAR would have more hospital injuries and charting errors. Inconsistent working hours, so there would be explained, unexplained disappearances. Complaints from patients, colleagues, supervisors, or lawsuits, or family members also. Um, evidence of diversion, such as missing broken vials, failure to document appropriately, or receiving controlled medications and inappropriate prescribing. Um, deterioration in appearances, mm, deterioration in physical health, such as with ICAR, where due to the chronic polysubstance use has eventually caused a cardiac problem leading to unstable angina. Um, changes in social interaction, where ICAR would often have increased conflicts with um, his workmates. So these are the outcomes for physicians who were able to enroll in a program such as the Physician Health Program, which will later on be discussed by the Doc Rene Obrapuno. Um, overall, physicians who have been enrolled in a program have had positive outcomes with an 80% satisfaction rate. 79% um, percent were licensed and working again. 16% experienced a positive drug test. 11% had their licenses revoked and 6% um, committed suicide. Um, on the left would be behaviors and beliefs associated with higher rates of recovery among physicians, um, which involves accept 
acceptance of the disease as a acceptance of addiction as a disease ability to be honest acceptance of spiritual principles strong affiliation with the program where i card doesn't seem to have any of these factors on the other hand risk factors for return to use or relapse would be use of potent opioids especially via iv comorbid mental disorder family history of addiction and use of multiple drugs all of which are present in ICAR, making for a high risk for relapse or return to use. Left untreated, given the aforementioned risk factors, and if these physicians were ever to re-enter back to without an appropriate program, there is a high relapse rate of 44% and a very high mortality rate of 9%. For assessment back to work, there are a lot of state regulations specifying that the physician's return to work should be based on their ability to practice medicine with reasonable skill and safety. Um, determination of the readiness of the physician to return to practice is based on their acceptance of their use disorder and understanding as a chronic disease. Completion of the treatment, including the coexisting psychiatric disorder. Improved management of triggers and stressors. Documentation of sustained abstinence through um, multiple urine drug screens. Strong social support. Motivation to follow an established care plan. Workplace has been notified and modifications and or restrictions have been agreed upon. So it is also recommended that once they have been cleared to go back to work, gradual re-entry should be done. Um, this involves a work re-entry contract outlining the individual's responsibilities that involves all the parties necessary and necessary stakeholders. Some have recommended limiting the working hours, so only during office hours, no, um, no night shift or or twenty four hour duties. Prohibition from the operation operation room and or medication cabinet, and they will always be accompanied by a monitor who reports to um, the program that they are entered in. For the last part of this presentation would be the biopsychosocial formulation. Here is my table. Okay, so Icar is a 63-year-old male with a physician presenting with chronic abuse of benzodiazepines and opioids due to his immersion in his work, which worsened after the sudden death of his wife. After the death of his alcoholic father he was left with an emotionally unavailable mom who only recognized him whenever he had an academic achievement in addition to this in making his siblings happy he was also able to garner their praises both of these becoming integral to his self-esteem eventually this translated to being a successful physician but in the case of overwhelming work he turned to substances to meet the said demands. He was unable to recognize that he was only met with impairment in work and relationships. He often refused help and the siblings just left him to do what he wanted. Icar is biologically predisposed to substance abuse due to his father's own alcohol abuse. The psychodynamic formulation acknowledges that there, is, there was a constant need for external validation that made up the essence of his self-esteem. Without this validation, he was vulnerable to self-esteem threats that eventually led to self-medication to mend his fragile self. In consideration to this dynamic, the psychiatrist addresses the empathic failures growing up by being a source of validating responses. This development of an idealizing transference creates an opportunity for the fragility of the self-esteem to be addressed. 
Icar's central conflict lies in his fragile self-esteem and constant need for external sources of validation as he becomes painfully aware of his own flaws and limitation. After the death of his father, there was an empathic failure that occurred where his own feelings of helplessness were not recognized because his mom was immersed in her own work to support the family. A validating response only occurred when he excelled academically or turned to exhibit exhibitionism from singing and dancing um, in front of his family to cheer them up, which became integral components of his self-esteem. His family was narcissistically invested in him in the hopes that he would be the one to bring an end to, the, to their hardships and pain. Without these, there was no gleam in the mother's eye. Having internalized only the grand expectations, this made his self-esteem fragile. After the series of imperfections, the sudden death of his wife and termination in work and less adaptive defenses, he turned to substances to regulate the painful emotions from his injured self-esteem. In therapy, Icar will look for that gleam in the mother's eye or the validating response that he's always used to and will continue to have grand expectations of himself. In the event that the therapist fails to respond empathically, they will be met with devaluation and anger. There must be a balance between validation and empathy to not perpetuate and able attitudes of the self-objects, which are the siblings, the son, and colleagues. In order to have a more realis real real realistic expectation of himself and his limitations, um, it is also prudent to explore for underlying pathologies such as anxiety and depression and medicate. Ketiapine and gabapentin have shown efficacy in treatment of said pathologies. In becoming kinder and more emotionally attuned, it will become a great source of strength. For I'm hopeful that with the right kind of care, Icar's broken wings will be mended so that he can soar to even greater heights. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Now we will be opening the floor for question and answer. Hi, good morning, Dr. D. So thank you very much for your very interesting case. I'm sure it was very challenging, no? but you were able to, to pull through it. So we have several questions from the audience. So I will start um, when, with one privately messaged question. So it goes, good morning. Was the spiritual aspect in the biopsychosocial formulation explored? And what could have been the protective factor of it? Good morning. Um, I apologize. I wasn't able to explore the spiritual aspect. But given this shift in perspective, if um, if Icar is able to turn to religion as a source of strength and guidance in whatever um, actions that he may take, it will become a very strong protective factor for him. Okay, thank you, Dr. D. In fact, studies do show that um, those who struggle with addiction, no, um, professionals or even not professionals, uh, do benefit from uh, no, um, joining spiritual groups or support groups or church groups um, years after they have decided to maintain sobriety. So yes, it, uh, for the one who, who asked this question, there is a huge... Um, factor with spirituality in the biopsychosocial care of a person with addiction. Now, the next question would be, so Dr. D, what would be the best aftercare program in your opinion for ICAR no? um, in terms of rehabilitation? Given that ICAR has a um, high risk, for relapse, given not only the nature of his profession and the workplace he's going to enter into, I would still recommend for him undergoing an inpatient rehabilitation. And for the specifics of the aftercare, maybe that's something that can be um, gradually 
um, explored depending on how he um, how he responds to the program itself. Okay, so you uh, I agree with you. Uh, the placement scheme for this particular patient for ICAR uh, seems to really warrant no? uh, an inpatient uh, facility care. So there are placement criteria no, for patients suffering from addiction. So that would be something of value for everyone to know. Um, I believe that can be, and that might be mentioned later on no, in the reactions. So for the next question, so Dr. D, how were you or your team able to navigate through the minimization, good question, yes. and denial of ICAR in terms of his symptoms? So it's very apparent no, that he was quite resentful, cynical, and even uh, uh, had a lot of pushback. So how did you navigate through that, Dr. D? I really had a difficult time talking to this patient. And um, it was really being aware of the psychodynamics given that it was important for him for the therapist to be a validating figure to him but at the same time it involves sort of a waltz or a back and forth between the conversation wherein in those waltz we can um we can hopefully see gates or opportunities where when those gates are explored it could be um, opportunities for building insight and exploring the symptoms that he often minimizes and denies. All right. So I think you might be pertaining to motivational interviewing. Case. Yes. We try to evoke uh, the personal motivations of ICAR to undergo treatment. No? So you're right. We don't debate or we don't fight with the patient, we roll with the resistance, and it is a dance. No? It is a dance um, through the resistances. So we try to get our foot in the door and use whatever personal motivations as leverage for them to even start considering long-term care. Okay, next question. I think we have um, time for, I think, two more. No, uh, Interesting, Denny Isa. Uh, what, I'm sorry, there is... There is a follow-up question from Dr. Batar, Dr. D. So she's asking, does confrontation have a role in motivational interviewing? In motivational interviewing, um, confrontation has a role, but maybe much later on when um, we were already able to build a relationship with the patient as well as have um, built some semblance of insight or readiness to change for him because it may be difficult if we um, confront him immediately and it's just going to evoke all the defenses and may possibly ruin the potential therapeutic relationship with them. Right. Maybe Dr. Maglake has something to add about the question, okay, Dr. Batar. Uh, yes, hello. Good morning. Uh, wait lang. Let me also. I'm looking for myself. It's my video on. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you for that um, question. Uh, in general, um, of course, uh, I guess that's the challenge. No? How do you balance um, the guiding part um, in motivational interviewing, especially if there are certain aspects siguro, that we want to um, parang psychoeducate. So in my motivational interviewing, for example, usually psychoeducation is done po, uh, by asking um, permission with the patient. And with, with in relation to um, confrontation, uh, it's not the confrontation as interrogation style in MI, but it is really more on um, with the active listening part of it. So for example, through reflection. Um, so when there are yes, no statements or there are statements that are not, um, uh, that are, uh, what do you call this? Um, parang in opposition of each other that was made um, by the patient, which is very common. Um, usually, it's good to kind of reflect it back to them. And when they do that, it, when we do that, it actually also helps them sort of think you know, or reflect 
more on what they say. Uh, furthermore, um, we can also utilize other techniques like um, summarizing or paraphrasing. Not only does it co help clarify what they're trying to say, but it also kind of makes them hear what they were trying to imply. We kind of state it for them, um, what, what, the, what the meaning of what they're trying to say is. So oftentimes, um, these techniques can actually help. Um, there is also a gentle confrontation type no, uh, that we call it in MI. Um, again, it's just with the spirit, uh, maintaining the spirit of collaboration. So um, perhaps um, what also comes into play is maintaining that um, parang partnership no, with the patient. So even if they are, let's say, um, let's say with the case of Dr. D, an impaired physician, um, perhaps one of the challenges is that the physician would still want to take some level of control. So how do we kind of navigate through that, but at the same time also being partners with them, meaning we're also able to kind of um, reflect back or point out certain inconsistencies. So there, it is still in the frame naman po of MI, as long as we also uphold the spirit of it. Um, which is why I also want to ask Dr. D, so were you able to kind of uphold no, itong, um spirit of MI collaboration, partnership, even if there was resistance from the, the patient? Mm -hmm. Yes, po, doctor. It was a lot of active listening and as well as clarification and summarizing. Po. I was also very hesitant in confronting given the dynamics, po. but um, luckily po, in the spirit of M, I, I was able to get um, pieces of information from her that she wasn't readily um, open to disclosing, such as the fentanyl or how she felt with the death of her husband. Thank you po. Thank you very much, Dr. Maglake, for that input. No? And Dr. D, so I believe Dr. Enriquez, the president of GAP, would like to add something to, to that question of Dr. Batar. Dr. Enriquez? Doctora? Oh, we can't hear you po, Doctora. Sorry, hello, Doctora Enriquez. Mm, I think... Oh, uh, um, Joyce, I think Hindi daw maka-unmute si Dr. Enrique. Ayan, pwede na po, Dr. Hi, Dr. Batar. Okay, um, for just to highlight what uh, Dr. Maglake explained and what uh, Dr. D has, has uh, discussed with us so far, and for all the uh, residents here, so for MI, in the, when we talk about MI, the, the spirit of MI, so we have autonomy, especially for this patient who's a physician and um, he's very, uh, we're, physicians are used to being um, authoritative, right? Or So in the spirit of MI, there's autonomy versus authority. So we in MI, we, we highlight the autonomy of the patient. Aside from that, there's collaboration versus confrontation. So we avoid confrontation, in fact, and we focus on collaborating with the patient. And aside from that, we also, aside from, we don't educate, we evoke, we evoke the, the motivation of the patient. So I guess instead of confrontation, we, we try to, we try to also develop discrepancy. And that's, how, that's our way of um, confronting the patient if you were to strictly follow um, doing um, MI with this patient. Thank you very much, Dr. Enriquez. So truly, no, um, motivational interviewing is really useful. It's really useful, especially for these kinds of patients who have a lot of pushback, who are in denial, and who are you know, literally um, resentful about entering into care. So there needs to be a finesse you know, um, and not, um, not you know, aggressive confronti confronting. So thank you, Dr. Enriquez and Dr. Maglake. So I think we have, um, I believe I was told we have two minutes, three minutes left. So we have time for one more question. Lucky for you, Dr. D. So the last question would be, uh, 
how do you go about your counter transferences in experiencing this particular case? How did you manage it? So as a young psychiatrist in training. Um, for my counter transference, um, admittedly, I was frustrated at this patient given that uh, I'm very um, worried and mindful of patients who are narcissistic. Um, it, it helped well, that I was aware of this so that when I talk with the patient or interact with him, um, it wouldn't show my counter-transferences to the patient. Um, it also helped that in being aware of this, I was a bit more mindful of how I was going to act and what I was going to say. And um, in turn, and factoring in yung dynamics, it helped me um, sort of guide how I was going to approach him as well as the goals for that um, interview or that encounter I was going to have with him. Um, also, I had a lot of supervision given na I really, um, given my counter transfer. So I was also guided in the way as to how I was going to approach my interview or my interaction with him. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Dees. I'm glad that you are that you are aware of your own emotions towards this patient. And I'm very glad that you found the value of supervision uh, to help you process these emotions. Okay, so I think our time is up. Um, it's time for us to proceed to the react um, reaction um, talks uh, for us to be done by noon time. Don't worry, we are time conscious. We want everyone to have a good um, lunch on time. So we'll get right to it. Uh, let's start with the reaction. Thank you, Dr. D, for presenting this very challenging case. Dr. D entitled his case Icarus, based on the Greek mythos of the same name, about Icarus who fell from the sky after flying to the sun with waxen wings, despite warnings from loved ones like his father. In a way, this story can be a metaphor of what is currently termed as an impaired physician defined as a physician who is unable to fulfill professional and personal responsibilities because of physical illness and or mental health problems and or alcohol dependence and drug dependence. Unfortunately, the case presented is not a rarity. According to multiple esteemed sources such as the UNDOC, NIH, American Medical Association, physician substance abuse has largely been underreported, but it is a pressing concern. This is the reason why countries like US, UK, and other countries with socialized medicine created physician health programs to address mental health problems, including substance abuse among physicians, especially because as physicians, impairment of our capacity to do work is very dire. These data, though we don't have any local data, suggests that the incidence of substance abuse among physicians is more common than we think. There are a lot of factors that was shared or common among those who were identified, and Dr. D was able to present the case, which also showed similar um, characteristics such as untreated anxiety or depression, family history of substance use disorders, trauma history, and the culture of medicine, such as the stigma held about mental health or pressures among physicians to be peak health because they are experts in this field. Furthermore, physicians are often reported to have multiple drug use because of easy access. So apart from alcohol use, which is common for both genders, physicians are also prone to self-medicating, especially when stressed. Apart from easy access, other occupational risk factors include stress, full working environment, lack of sleep, and psychological risk factors such as perfectionism, low self-esteem, low frustration tolerance, and poor emotion regulation. These factors were actually illustrated in the case presented by Dr. D. Unfortunately, despite being healthcare providers, 
physicians were noted to have poor health seeking or help seeking behaviors when it comes to mental health problems, especially substance abuse. These barriers identified were denial of substance dependence, the stigma regarding persons who use substances, which can be a personal stigma that they hold among um, regarding people who use substances, or the fear of being stereotyped or stigmatized. Psychiatric comorbidities also present barriers, familial, social, and economic consequences, such as loss of um, their license or loss of livelihood is an important barrier. And another one that was identified was lack of education. And this lack of education is about substance dependence. When is someone dependent or when is someone already um, abusing a substance? Um, the American Medical Association noted that among physicians, there was actually um, lack of education or psychoeducation on when um, someone becomes addicted. Apart from personal barriers of the physician to seek help, there were also noted challenges or barriers among their colleagues. So oftentimes, colleagues or um, stakeholders like friends and other people would be the ones to bring patients to seek help or encourage them to seek help. Unfortunately, there is a term coined by the American Medical Association called the conspiracy of silence. And what is this conspiracy of silence? It pertains to the culture of staying silent when seeing colleagues who potentially have substance use disorders. Despite legal or regulatory mandates to report such colleagues, oftentimes the conspiracy of silence persists, especially if the following are met the seniority of the impaired physician, just like what was seen in this case, fear of legal consequences. What will happen if I report? Will I be um, legally um, liable for reporting a colleague? Confidentiality issues is also part of it. Denial or difficulty in accepting that the colleague is impaired. So sometimes, especially if this is a person who is esteemed in the field, um, colleagues may have difficulty accepting that there is weakness in this person or that this person is in need of help. Attempts to protect the institution's reputation. So this can be um, in, in terms of the hospital administration, so their efforts to um, uh, avoid certain um, maybe uh, controversies or certain information being leaked about their physicians and delegation of responsibility. So this one pertains to um, questions among colleagues on who should be responsible for encouraging this person to seek help. Should it be the family? Should it be hospital administration, etc. In relation to this, families also have certain barriers or challenges when reporting a physician who is impaired fear of economic or social consequences, especially if this physician is the one supporting the family, as is what is seen in this case. Loss of medical license of the impaired physician, um, which, can, which is related with the feelings of shame, you know, of having a relative who can lose their license, or fears that this impaired physician, upon losing their livelihood, might commit suicide. Pharmacologic expertise is also a barrier. So sometimes there's rationalization with the families that um, because this person is a physician, they are the experts. They know what they are doing. All of these factors present a lot of challenges for us psychiatrists. So these challenges are commonly encountered in the form of countertransferential issues. For example, like in the case presented, many physicians have underlying psychodynamic vulnerabilities, making them vulnerable to substance use. A common psychodynamic issue um, reported is perfectionism or the perfectionistic nature, which is apparently common among physicians. This may manifest as narcissistic defenses, devaluing the psychiatrist during consult, or by denial, minimizing, or downplaying impairment. Dr. D illustrated it in his case. For example, the difficulty in acquiring history because of minimization, 
or how they needed to have multiple sources in order to understand you know, the totality of the case. Physicians are also often placed in a higher position with regards to decision making. Hence, when they become patients, they may be reluctant to assume this role or subjecting themselves to interventions. Control-seeking behaviors may be seen in um, sessions with a psychiatrist, or it can be related to efforts of the physician patient to project this perfect self to the psychiatrist. Lastly, in relation to the first two factors, physician background of success is also a challenge as older physicians or those who have a certain level of seniority in their field may be reluctant to admit to certain impairments, which may lead them to minimize symptoms once more or when pressed, devaluing the psychiatrist. For example, in the case presented, there was note of um, younger physicians being looked down upon. Professional boundaries is another challenge that the psychiatrist might um, encounter. For example, um, how it is like in medicine when we need advice or referral, doctors are free to call each other. So sometimes, at least uh, what was reported is that uh, physicians tend to want informal consultations over the phone or they may be treating their psychiatrist colleague with over-familiarity as if they are a friend or a colleague. So, you know, you should give certain, um, certain leeways for them. Hence, it's very important for psychiatrists to be able to equip themselves to face these challenges. One of the challenges, as cited by the sources that you can see here on this slide, is um, being able to establish your frame or your role. So it's important for the psychiatrist to understand or to know if this physician came in as a referral by an institution or is it a, an individual consult. Clarity on this um, may also pertain to being more clear on ethical and legal obligations of the psychiatrist. An initial consult's goal can be the following, arrive at the preliminary diagnostic impression, determine severity, assess whether the person poses harm to self and others, assess um, formul or formulate recommendations for treatment. So if you notice, um, for us to be able to do this in the initial evaluation, it's also important for psychiatrists to be equipped with different approaches to treatment. It may be important to utilize multimodal treatment methods such as group therapy, enrollment in the program, or coordination with the institution for monitoring. Rapport with the colleague might present, might present numerous barriers to care. Hence, the psychiatrist must always refer out if the impaired physician has close ties to them professionally. So it's not just being a friend, but professional ties. Maybe um, being in the same institution. So according to the American Medical Association, it will be best to refer them out. It is also important to remember for the psychiatrist that physicians who seek help usually present are, are usually at the severe stage of substance use, even if they present otherwise. So oftentimes, um, at least according to studies, physicians um treat the psychiatric consult as their last resort. So it's always good to have that index of suspicion or um, inquisitiveness. It may also be good to be able to establish a frame to avoid certain boundary issues. This can be established in your first session or um, involve um, institutions that are, are referring institutions in terms of the comprehensive plan for treatment. Other recommendations for psychiatrists is actually capacity building. So sometimes what was noted to um, be a barrier or a challenge to psychiatrists is the lack of information that they can that they have when it comes to dealing with an impaired physician. For example, you can see here the code of ethics for physicians in the country. Section 6 
quoted directly from it, a physician should be upright, diligent, sober, modest, and well-versed. But there is no regulation regarding reporting or whose responsibility is it to report or certain institutional regulations in place or um, institutional or association, no? um, specialty association regulation. So there's really nothing um, in place. Hence, this may um, pose a lot of challenges for the psychiatrist. So one of the recommendations is for psychiatrists to actually have um, certain workshops on impaired physician or distressed physician training so that they would be aware on what is in their disposal. Apart from psychiatrists having this type of lecture or workshop, um, studies are also um, show that it is good for physicians to attend lectures, so non-psychiatrists. For non-psychiatrists, the goal is psychoeducation and the deep stigmatization of mental health, normalizing it in such a way that physicians also face stressors that the general population face. Hence, the need for self-care is also important. So what this means is that being able to um, illustrate that the job of a physician, like other professions, also pose certain risks. And so anyone can actually be um, vulnerable to mental health problems. And self-care and detection is important to prevent these or to at least address these vulnerabilities so that it wouldn't result to further harm and even a loss of livelihood for them. As mentioned previously, this is really an important issue because it is not a rare occurrence. I'm sure many of us listening to Dr. D's presentation probably had an encounter with an impaired physician, and it was um, perhaps very challenging as well for us. Hopefully, the discussion can ignite having meetings with certain stakeholders in your own institutions so that certain protocols can be set to place um, in terms of managing physician impairment. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. D, for your presentation. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Renee Celeste Obrapuno, and I am the reactor from GAP for today's APCC. So today I'd like to focus on the Physician Health Program, or the PHP. So this is in response to Dr. D's very interesting case today on a physician struggling with addiction. So we're talking about the help for the health provider with addiction. Now, anyone can get afflicted with addiction even professionals. So as you can see here, I highlighted the main character of a famous TV show, Dr. House. And for those who know about the show, he was very severely uh, addicted to substances. So what is the PHP system of care management? So this is a resource for physicians, healthcare professionals, and those in medical training who suffer from potentially impairing conditions. So this does not only cover substance use disorders, but as well as medical, behavioral, and or psychiatric problems. Now, the role of the Physician Health Program is to help coordinate effective detection, evaluation, and treatment. And it doesn't even stop there. It goes as far as aftercare. So it helps coordinate the continuing care monitoring of physicians with these impairing conditions. So the goals for the PHP are as follows. So of course, we want for the professional, the medical professional, to achieve long-term recovery, to maintain his or her medical career if deemed fit to return back to practice, to protect the public, and to maintain patient confidence in their healthcare providers. So there is essentially a dual mission for the PHP, and that is to support the physicians diagnosed with a potentially impairing condition and to protect the patient's safety by monitoring services. Now, we have gone through several literature in preparation for today's APCC. Unfortunately, there's not much local data. But uh, as of one um, particular study uh, back, uh, done back in 2021, I believe they, this is one of the most widely um, conducted researches on PHP. 
they studied and observed about 300 affected physicians over a five-year duration, and they came up uh, with these findings. This is the blueprint for your recommended physician health program. So we have the referral part, the placement, and of course, the monitoring. So for the referral part, uh, physicians get, uh, or the healthcare provider gets enrolled um, through the referrals of colleagues, medical boards, medical staff, schools, family members, and self-referrals. Now, we have what we call the compassionate interference. Now, in the case presented today by Mr. by Dr. D, the colleagues of the patient, was, they, were, um, they were apprehensive to report the patient because they were afraid that they would taint their relationship. But in fact, this is what the studies have called the conspiracy of silence. And this actually does more, more harm than um, benefit. So compassionate interference, um, it talks about uh, administering care, actually legal obligation to liaise the, the um, affected uh, physician to the appropriate care. 95% of individuals with substance use disorders do not think they have a problem. So it actually explains why many physicians who suffer from an addiction, they appear resentful or critical of even considering enrolling into a PHP. Compassionate interference often administered by healthcare providers, family members, friends, employers, and colleagues remain as a vital tool to connect the affected individual to the proper care. And there is even a legal, a legal no, obligation for, for us to report someone who is suffering from a condition that can affect patient safety. Now, the potential ramifications of not um, intervening or, no, or the conspiracy of silence are as follows. We put the physician's patients at risk or, um, of harm. Then second, we subject themselves to potential professional or legal sanctions. There's a delay in the physician's entry to treatment. And there's the increasing negative long-term impact of substance use disorder on the physician's family and career. Now, um, intervention is the process of presenting facts to the affected individual. So this way, the hope is it raises awareness, it lessens denial, and it motivates the affected individual to make changes in his or her life. So the aim is to help the physician accept professional care with sensitivity to their profession, employment, licensure, and desire for anonymity. So participants in an intervention describe to the patient specific, observable, problem behaviors and incidents that have led to their concern about impairment. So if it helps, writing a letter or a script for the intervention can be useful. So they should be, um, those who are intervening, they should be kind, empathetic, with avoid accusation, blame, or even negotiating. So the goal of the intervention is to guide the um, affected individual to a specific plan of action. Okay, so those who are part of the inter intervention can be colleagues, friends, staff, family, and the intervention leader should be an experienced professional who is familiar with the intricacies of a doctor's role. Now, the leader should not be the physician's friend, close colleague, or employer. So these are relationships that might compromise a person's objectivity. So it should be um, a third party, okay? Now, moving on, after referral, now, of course, we have to decide what kind of care would be appropriate to the patient. Now, for this um, part, the ASAM criteria or the American Society of Addiction Medicine's um, levels of care would be very good in helping us uh, make a decision, okay? What kind of, um, what intensity of treatment ang kailangan ng pasyente? So from level one all the way to level four, from ambulatory care all the way to medically managed um, intensive inpatient withdrawal. Okay. This is a whole other lecture, but um, I'm flashing this um, to everyone so everyone is aware that this, there is a placement guide. So this helps determine the intensity, the intensity 
and frequency of service needed now using uh, these criteria. Now the next part is the monitoring. Okay. Now during this phase or the maintenance phase, the patient undergoes several options of care. So it's a mix of what works for the person. Psychotherapy, psychiatric um, follow-ups, 12-step um, support groups, anonymous meetings, self-help recovery um, support groups, work site monitoring, daily or random drug or substance screening. Now, it's important to highlight here that during this monitoring phase, the physicians participating in the PHP are typically asked to enter into a formal monitoring agreement. It outlines the expectations of the physician and related contingencies. So these are what are expected of the person should he or she want to um, uh, continue with practice or to have, of course, and or to have um, a healthy life with or without the continuation of practice. Okay, so the components of the agreement are generally as follows, as you hear, see here in front of you. Withdrawal from clinical practice until they are deemed fit, safe to return. Avoidance of mood-altering substances. Participation in adequate and appropriate um, uh, SUD treatment as determined by, um, of course, a professional evaluator. Participation in other health care. Participation in weekly or monthly group sessions. Random um, substance screening, regular contact with the PHP to monitor the behavior, and demonstration of factors associated with readiness to return to practice safety. Now, um, the thing is, according to the study, uh, those who uh, are under moderate to severe um, cases of substance use um, addiction, they usually benefit from minimum five-year rigorous monit uh, monitoring un under this behavioral agreement. So interventions are proportional to the level of non-compliance. So if there are transgressions in this behavioral agreement, there needs to be um, interventions or follow-through. But it also depends sa level ng, ng transgression. So it ranges from verbal intervention and warning with motivational strategies increased frequency or intensity of toxicology testing, immediate withdrawal from practice and clinical reevaluation, or if needed, admittance into an appropriate ASAM level of care, possibly an inpatient treatment. Okay. So usually this is signed by the patient, the, um, the addiction specialist, colleagues or other um, witnesses or team of uh, team who are part of the in intervention. So according to the study, um, the helpfulness of the PHP monitoring agreement components are as follows. So it really does help no, in long-term care. Uh, the most valuable um, components are as follows. The 12-step attendance, no, uh, formal substance use disorder treatment, and random testing. So these are the top three most valuable um, components of the behavioral agreement. Now, post-monitoring results, uh, it was found that most respondents continued participation in 12-step programs after. Okay? Uh, a significant percentage had participation in religious gatherings, which helped them maintain sobriety. And some even participated in other community or support meetings. Now, what about returning to work? So most state regulations in the state specify only that the physician's return to work should be based on their ability to practice medicine with reasonable skill and safety, leaving the judgment in individual cases up to the treatment team and the PHP. So in the U.S., the Federation of State Physician Health Programs has issued guidelines for recommended monitoring agreement elements and return to work requirements. So here are some of the bases to determine if a physician is ready to return to work acceptance of this addiction diagnosis, understanding of addiction as a chronic relapsing disease that requires lifelong attention, completion of treatment, documentation of sustained abstinence, treatment and status of co-occurring psychiatric disorders, judgment and cognition, the physician's ability to, ma to manage stressors and triggers, 
have a support not network, estimated risk of return to use um, or relapse, and motivation to follow an established continuing care of plan. Now, there are occupational factors considered in assessing the physician's readiness to return to work, and this generally includes legal or licensure requirements um, that it has to be satisfied. Now, workplace monitor or supervisor has been identified and accepts the responsibilities of, monitor, um, of monitoring or regulating, and the necessary workplace modifications or practice restrictions have been agreed upon. Now, we don't expect for those who are allowed to return to work, we don't expect them to let's go right in back to how they were before. It's a, it's a gradual, step-by-step -step, um, reintegration. So returning to work is a staged process. So restrictions may be placed on the physician's practice, at least initially, to protect the physician and um, the physician's patients. So the physician may be prohibited from certain parts of the hospital, um, especially when there where there is access to the drugs. They're not permitted to take overnight shifts. They are restricted access to controlled medications. They're required to have a monitor who is in contact with the PHP. They have limited number of settings at which the physician may practice, so it's easier to monitor them and, and have better accountability. And there's restrictions based on uh, a place on the physician's medical license by a regulatory agency or board. Now let's talk about the law of the land, the Philippines. Um, so the Republic Act number 2382, or the Medical Act of 1959, there are grounds for reprimand, suspension, or revocation of registration certificate or license. So that includes addiction to alcoholic beverages or any habit-forming drug, rendering the doctor incompetent to practice the profession or to any form of gambling. So gambling is part of it. Reinstatement is after two years, according to this law. The board may order reinstatement um, if the respondent has acted in an exemplary man manner in the community wherein he resides and has not committed any illegal, immoral, or dishonorable act. So in conclusion, the components of the PHP monitoring agreements for addiction are overwhelmingly viewed as acceptable and helpful to the physicians who have completed the program. Um, it is worth the cost and crucial to their recovery. Most participants reported continued participation in mutual support groups five or more years after completing the uh, monitoring agreements. And the recovery rate um, uh, in you know, PHP studies in general far exceed the SUD remission rates in studies of other clinical populations. So PHPs do work. Um, hopefully we can have more uh, programs set in place locally you know, to help those uh, fellow doctors who are in need of this kind of help. So thank you very much. And these are my references. Thank you. Psychiatry Consortium. Thank you everyone for attending today's Addiction Psychiatry Consortium Conference. Before we end today's session, kindly save the dates for the following APCCs. APCC is held every third Wednesday, every two months. The next one being June 21, 2023, where the presenting institution would be NCMH. Should there be any changes, we will be informing your representatives for each institution through our APCC group chat. But please save the date, June 21, 2023 for NCMH. And before we end, may we also please ask everyone to give us your feedback. You can scan the QR code flashed on the screen or you can also go to bit.ly bit.ly slash gap addiction consortium 2023 your and final reminder may we please ask everyone to open their videos for our class picture taking <laughs> Pwede na po, ayan. 